I'm surprised you're gonna get this education. Okay, I'm recording. When I saw when I saw your email, oh, oh. I'm recording. I'm recording. I'm recording. Hello everyone. Hi everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to our final luncheon for this academic year. And we so enjoyed the program. We hope you've enjoyed coming as much as we have enjoyed hosting this year. Um, this is my last year on the committee. I'm outgoing chair. Sarah Doyle is incoming chair. She was co-chair this year, and she's going to be our chair next year. Also, I'd like to introduce and thank for all their hard work our member at large, members at large, Cynthia and Shauna, Cynthia Merritt, Shauna. Cynthia Merritt, Shauna Reavers, <laughs> and last but not least, our secretary, Don Niedermiller. The union office, the staff, Mark, Michelle, Tammy, phenomenal. None of this would be happening. None of this would be happening if it weren't for your union. Working for you, we are working for each other. So this is an opportunity for us to get together on a monthly basis and just share ideas and help perpetuate or what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah. <laughs> information that we need to do our jobs and to, to be happy employees here at Wayne State. So on that note, um, I'll introduce again Sarah, who's going to, are you going to start the, or yeah, Ricardo? Yeah, Ricardo's up. Ricardo's up next. Check the agenda. Yeah, we do. Thank you, Ricardo. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Happy springtime. Hopefully we'll get out of here before the rain. All right, Michael. Oh, yeah. Keep me on camera. Um, so we're doing our slides here. So how many have been to this workshop once before? So just, to, okay, so this is the first time. And the thing is, a lot of our workshops have been going on for a long time, different topics. This one actually came up as a fantastic idea because we have all these acronyms and all these names and all these groups and committees and councils that seem to do sometimes overlapping things and you'll see people that you see as leaders in one area maybe overlapping in committees. So what you're going to hear is from each of the groups. My role is just to give you a little bit for those who are more visual um, a way to, to try to think about this and different ways to sort it out. Um, so this is a, a, a loose attempt to do so. You're here because you're an academic staff member. We all have that in common. We have all of our different classifications, ASOs, um, extension program coordinators, counselors, advisors. And what you may know or may not know, depending on how new you are, if your title is academic advisor, your designation, you may be doing academic advising, direct face what we think of traditionally with students. Um, but you may also be doing that if you're an ASO. Or you may be like myself, an academic advisor for, I don't do any direct academic advising right now. I work with student organizations in the Dean of Students Office. Because of the way that we've evolved over time, those university classifications and what we actually do is often blurry, which makes it challenging for us for things like ESS, promotion, tenure, selective salary. And we continue to work that out, but if you're new, that's one thing that you should get right off the bat is that those designations sometimes look a little different um, from what we do. Likewise, we have these organizations. Um, on this one side, we've got the uh, AUP AFT Local, which is our union, the ASSC, the Academic Staff Steering Committee, which is hosting this workshop, um, and the Union Council. Over here, Academic Staff Professional Development Committee, Academic Staff Mentoring Committee. So I'm going to talk about briefly these two pieces first. The reason these are in separate groupings are because on this side, you have union-supported, union-constructed, financed, and backed. Um, and then on this side, you've got pieces that are the result of contractual agreements between the union and the administration. But the ASPDC, for example, the chair of the ASPDC is typically an administrator selected and appointed from the provost's office. The committee members are academic staff members. Um, the academic staff mentoring committee per, was received initial funding and is, I believe is still getting support um, from the provost's office. But these, again, these are 
pieces that were negotiated in the, in the contract. And then you've got the academic senate, which is our, the, the governance structure that works in shared governance with the administration. So many of us, we are all represented on the academic side in this area. So you've got sometimes things are blurry between is it academic senate or is it union? Just for knowing now that sometimes those things, those things blur and overlap. Um, and then we've got, what well, last year we didn't present that, but we have the academic advising, oh, I've got to get this right, the academic training academy and the academic advising, advising advisor council. Advisor training academy. Advisor training academy. Advi so these both things are, are so, so ignore this and watch the slides. You'll see, you'll get presentations from these. Advisor training academy and the advising, academic advising council committee. Um, these two entities now, are, are relatively more recent. They work with our advisors, and I was, as I was looking at how do we, another way to maybe think about distinguishing these is that these groups, the two big ones here, are about us as professionals, but oftentimes the programming is about how to help us move along our professional path, our professional development. More inward facing in that sense, it, it indirectly benefits our students when we are able to do things better. From what I've learned, and what you're going to learn more about with these two entities, are a lot of their programming and purpose is about common current trends in advising, things to that work for directly with our student uh, students. So they may be uh, things that you would pick up at a uh, NASPER or NACADA or um, ACA type a meeting, ACPA meetings. Um, so those things that you'll go off campus to. These are this is something that we have in house. So you'll hear much more about all of these from the different representatives. So that's just the overview. You're going to get in and hear now from each of those, and then we can talk. But if you're new, just know that there's a lot of acronyms. You'll see different people that seem to be doing the same things. It's nice to know the history. You'll hear the history of each of these groups um, and kind of where they're at. But they do have, they're all here for us and how to help us serve students. So, thanks. If I, haven't, <laughs> if I haven't met you before, my name is Michelle Fecto, and uh, I've been here on campus, I can't believe it's over 20 years now, um, and I started off as an academic um, uh, staff member uh, in an extension program coordinator in the Labor Studies Center, and then got involved with the union, and then they needed an executive director, so I quit my university job, and your dues pays my salary. So uh, one of the things uh, we, that I do is work with the officers who are elected by you that are members of the union, you have to be full members, and then um, and we have various functions. Um, uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up that um, in relation to what uh, Ricardo was just mentioning, so there's different groups and sometimes they, do, they have different functions. The union's function is outlined in the law. So there's a law, there's Michigan Public Employees Relations Act, which, which gives us the legal right to exist. And it stipulates what we do and what the, the administration has to honor um, and that we do. If several we have to insist on it, uh, like when they come up with new uh, flex comp time policies without negotiating with us and things like that. So we do, the union deals around issues of wages, hours, and working conditions. And um, by law, we have the right to organize and uh, work and form agreements, like our collective bargaining agreement here, um, which is signed by the administration and the union, and that is binding on all everybody within our union. So our union is all faculty that's 50% or more, and academic staff that's 50% or more. Um, we represent them all, and that's called the bargaining unit. Um, and People have the choice of whether to belong as a full member or not. Um, I want to say, Mark, it's about 75% um, and almost 100% of academic staff, because academic staff are awesome, um, <laughs> and understand the, uh, the need for it. But the union has been here since like 1972, and that's kind of what this is about. And it started because the administration, as without a union, they can do, any employer can do, decided to fire a bunch of people right before Christmas, okay, and uh, lay them off. Not in any particular order, um, and not with any consultation. And this spurred, this sort of um, arbitrary action spurred the faculty 
um, to organize and to form a union because they understood, and, and the academic staff, because they understood that if you have a contract and it's binding, it, it's, it's not perfect. I wish it was even more powerful, but it gives power to stop that kind of arbitrary action. Number one, they have to abide by the contract. Number two, if it's dealing with wages, hours, working conditions, and they decide to make a change, the law says they're supposed to negotiate with representatives of your union. So, um, so that's the purpose for it of why we started, and that's why we continue to exist. Um, we jointly we started out with the AAUP the first time we had an election. The, there was like several unions that were trying to represent us. Um, the AAUP won. It includes the medical school, the law school, and the, just across the whole campus, which is pretty unusual. A lot of um, unionized higher ed do not include the medical, their medical schools. They have a separate unit for their law schools. So, and the administration threw them in. They wanted them to be part of the bargaining unit because they thought they would all vote against the union and that the administration would win, we wouldn't have a union. Well, that didn't work, so now they're in. Um, let's see, and so it shows the composition. Um, so, but what I'd like to say the union really is, and I'm not going to take up too much more time because there's a bunch of speakers, but the union is, to me, us looking out for each other, teaching each other what we need to know, making sure people know that they're pulling a colleague uh, you know, aside in the hallway and saying, do you know the, that these are your rights? When somebody is in, a, in maybe a, a department meeting and the chair or associate dean or a director decides to be a little bit belligerent or unfair to that person, it's the, the ability of the group to come together as others to speak up and say, you know, that's not right, that's not fair. It's looking, so a union, and it's in, I think in the most grassroots level, is our um, ability to look out for each other and to have some protections in this document that protect you from being fired for that. And the law actually says, you are protected for concerted activity. And that's when two or more people, you don't even have to be in a union, it could be at McDonald's, two or, uh, two or more employees come together to look out for mutual interests, to look out for each other. That is recognized as a union. So a union is about people in its, in its most essential form, is us looking out for each other, for each other's mutual interests and standing together to do that. And the more we do it, the stronger we are. And uh, now, we had to have a vote, because once you have the majority of the people in the union and the bargaining unit vote for the union, then the employer must negotiate with us. We are recognized. Um, I know in the next few years, uh, we're probably going to go with something called right to work. So uh, right, what right to work means is, is the, our, the laws were amended, the labor laws were amended to, to say that um, states or could pass laws that may give you the option so you don't have to pay dues. You, but the union, by law, is still obligated to represent you. Right? Try to do that with your taxes. See how that works. Don't pay your taxes and see what happens. But um, what, this is, what this is, is it's a way to bankrupt the union so we can't pay for lawyers, we can't do the things that we need to do, we can't provide you lunch and bring people together to, uh, to you know, organize. Um, so, uh, so there's going to be some changes <laughs> with the law to look out for. And we are organizing now, and Mark has been working really hard to make sure everybody understands how important that is. Um, there's opportunities to get involved. We're going to be having uh, nomination forms for the ASSC. We hope that you will consider running, or if you know somebody who will run, it's only a one-year term unless you run for the co-chair, like um, Marianka and Sarah have done, and Mike Stamps, and many people <laughs> who've been around have done. Then it's a two-year term. You, you be the co-chair and then the chair the next year. So that's one way to get involved. We have a, a gender equity group uh, and uh, just looking around uh, wage equity issues. Um, we have uh, groups that are coming together around, well, that sort of ad hoc with the Social Justice Committee. Did you want to speak to any of that? Okay, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and a Communications Committee that Mark has been organizing. But if you have any questions, you can talk to me, and I'm sure Mark will, after they can talk to you. So that's, is there any questions for me? I don't want to take up any more time. Okay, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm up again.
again. We're going to talk about now, did all of you know that everyone here can put on their professional record that they are a member of the Academic Staff Standing Committee? Steering. So, no. standing. They're standing. They're steering. We're They're standing. standing. We're the steering committee, the leadership. So it's so confusing because our bylaws, we just realized this not too long ago, <laughs> bylaws say standing committee throughout the whole thing until you get to the leadership, and then it says steering committee. So I've interpreted this that we're all members of the academic staff. Is it steering, steering. committee or standing? The officers are steering. The, the membership is standing. Yeah, that's, that's how I interpreted it. So the <laughs> bottom line is, please, when you go back to your offices, update your professional record, put this down as uh, participation and service. You're on a committee. Um, and coming every month helps us do what we're supposed to do. Now, I was going to spend the majority of my time asking you, encouraging you to run for either one of the two members at large positions, the co-chair, the secretary. We've given you nomination forms. Everybody should have one. It looks like this. You can self-nominate or you can have someone nominate you. But the bottom line is it's a great opportunity for you to get more involved. It's fun. What did you guys say it was fun this year? We had a lot of fun. And we, we get to pick the food. That's the cool part. <laughs> um, we don't have to adhere to the university rules. We have to go through Aramark and all that lousy food that ASPDC has. We're on a much smaller budget than ASPDC, but we I think we've done a lot with what we've, what we've got. And the union has been very generous to us. They've never said, oh, you're over budget, because sometimes we've been over budget. Um, so I just wanted to encourage everyone to consider running for one of the positions. It would be nice to have more. I think when I ran for co-chair, I was unopposed. So it would be nice to have some real election going this time where we have multiple people um, running for the same position, a real election. So anyway, any questions for me about the Academic Staff Steering Standing Committee? Okay, thank you guys for your time. We actually have a lot of members um, that participate in the meetings, uh, but there are certain there are certain voting members <laughs> there are certain voting members that are elected actually by your, or nominated I guess by your dean and then chosen I believe by the provost office to serve. Uh -huh. Policy committee. Policy committee. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you uh, to serve in the ASPDC uh, committee. Uh, so a few things I want to just highlight is that we were established in 1986. Uh, like they mentioned, we were born out of the contract. Uh, we're obligated, like this, not obligated, it's a weird way to put it, but it was part of the contract between the union and the university to create this organization, ASBDC, and we're allotted a certain amount of funding for different activities, professional development, uh, with the aim of professional development from the provost office. Uh, just some things to kind of highlight, and I'll try to make this pretty quick. Uh, we do events, like we mentioned, uh, for professional development. Uh, we just had our awards ceremony. Uh, I'd like to kind of recognize them again. I know Don's here. Uh, Don Niedermeyer won for Outstanding. What was that for? Outstanding Professional Contributor? Yep. Juanita? Juanita's right back there, yeah. She was awarded the uh, Professional Achievement Award. And then Kristen, I could have sworn, oh yeah, here, here sorry. Uh, take a seat now. <laughs> uh, she was awarded the Distinguished Service Award. Uh, those are sent out uh, yearly um, for staff to nominate individuals. And these guys, again, did a great job. Um, we reviewed their professional records, and they're all really amazing. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, some other... Uh, some other events that we have coming up on May 11th, we have an extension tour. I believe the invite was sent out to that. You should RSVP. You can go see the Schoolcraft and OCC, or Oakland Center, I guess, Oakland Center uh, extension sites. Uh, it's a great little experience for you. Uh, June 14th, we also have the annual picnic, which I always remember because they rub you. They give you a massage, which is always <laughs> a nice perk. You should definitely go because of that. 
Well, not only because of that, you know, you know network and all that. But, uh, <laughs> um, also, in addition to the awards, some of our other major events are, are the things that we do is the travel grant. Uh, so any individuals who are going to conferences, and we definitely encourage you to do that, can receive assistance uh, to cover any of those fees or any type of travel expenses that you may have. Uh, just as a quick breakdown, up to $300, we can, and again, it's, it's up to the discretion of the ASBDC committee, we can fund 100% up to $300. After $300, we can fund up to 50% to $800. So I guess that means if you have a $1,600 trip, we can fund up to $1,800. Or $800. If you have a 1700 trip, we can still only fund up to $800. Um, let's see, outside of that, oh, one more thing. So we are the ASPDC, and there are other committees too. We're all here to help you and provide events and opportunities for you to grow as people and as professionals. Uh, but one thing that we try to do is also take suggestions. If anybody has ever gone to one of these conferences and has seen a speaker, or has just known about someone who could really provide good information uh, for our professional development, please let us know. Uh, we would definitely like to review those um, opportunities and then potentially fund them too. Like I mentioned, we have money for travel grants and for uh, professional development opportunities. Any questions, concerns? No? Excellent. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, my name is Matt Fredericks. I'm here to speak about the Academic Staff Mentoring Committee. Funny coincidence, Dennis has been my mentee the last couple of years and I've been his mentor, mentor and uh, we didn't even arrange that. We didn't even grease any palms to make that <laughs> transition happen. Um, <clears throat> let's see, who are we? Well, the committee, um, a number of us are here today. Uh, myself, Nada Simon, Kristen Chinnery, um, I see Melissa Barton out there, you know, uh, and Diane Fears and Tamara Serrano, the current committee. <clears throat> Let's see. What do we do? We match uh, senior academic staff with new academic staff. You, so basically someone who has ESS, uh, who has been through that grueling five-year process, um, we match them with new staff uh, to assist them first and foremost with the ESS process with promotion, um, because you all remember, when you come in here, you, when you first got hired, you may not have known anything about that. And the first 50 times someone said ESS, Employment <laughs> Security Status, it just went into this kind of gobbledygook of acronyms that it took a while to figure out. So this senior academic staff member is really uh, meant to just share some uh, tidbits of knowledge, um, work, with a, work with a junior staff. Beyond that, we know Wayne State is a large uh, place, um, and there's a lot of, let's see, there's silos here. There's the Wayne Way, which can uh, sometimes be good, but not necessarily always. Students speak of being waned, and uh, it can happen to academic staff, it can happen to anyone here. And so we try to, in part, share some of those uh, secrets, general knowledge, point things out. A mentor-mentee relationship uh, can really have an, a number of facets uh, to it. <clears throat> um, but it's really about, um, kind of as Michelle talked about, people helping people, people looking out for people um, here and assisting with their personal and professional growth um, in the university. <clears throat> uh, the thing about the mentor-mentee relationship also, it's really up to them, to the two people, to determine it for themselves. You could meet every other week, you could meet uh, you could have a quick phone call, you could meet once a month, once a semester. It's really up to those two people uh, to determine it. How do you become one? Well, you fill out this, you go to this web form here. And once a year, really, in the fall, we do a full call for new people, uh, for new mentors and mentees. You could fill this form out right now if you want, and we would keep it there. Um, it's really in the fall when we do a full thing. If someone Throughout the year, sometimes we've been able to match a mentee for the mentor right then and there. Um, it kind of depends if the mentors are available. Um, there's less of them. <clears throat> Let's see. All right. As an aside, uh, what are your, obviously for the mentees, your incentives are 
not to put things in that sort of language of incentives. <laughs> Hopefully it's out of the goodness of your heart, but um, the mentee learns something, or the mentors, they actually have a uh, deal. Uh, we've been supported by the provost, um, thanks to Nada Simon, who originally had an excellent relationship working right there with the provost, and they uh, give us some money for this. So you can get $200 um, travel, uh, what do we call it, travel money. Mm -hmm. And it works. I actually did it this year. It was nice. I was a, uh, um, it can defray the cost. If you put that along with an ASPDC travel grant, it really gives you uh, a great way to subsidize professional development. Um, <clears throat> so, to actually be on the academic staff mentoring committee, um, you would have to be on one of the other committees here. Um, the ASSC, ASPDC, uh, the union. So all of us were sort of selected uh, or appointed from those, I believe. Um, and this is a fair, probably the most recent of the committees uh, that's gone on. We've just been around about four or five years. Four or five years. Any mentors, mentees in here? All right, I see a few of you. Um, and we do an icebreaker meeting in the fall, and in that meeting, once you filled out the form, you come, we have lunch, we do a kind of thing we'll call speed dating. Uh, you get to meet everyone really quick um, <clears throat> and get a sense of you know, who they are, what they're doing, and that helps people sort of get an idea of who they'd like for their mentor or mentee. And then the committee takes that uh, stuff along with these uh, forms that have been filled out. Um, we use a proprietary algorithm. We've developed uh, in collaboration with Match.com, and we <laughs> match up the mentors and the mentees. Just joking, just joking. And uh, and they and then they're off. We notify them, and they you know kind of determine the parameters of their uh, relationship. <clears throat> I think that's about it. Thank you. and I am chair of the AAUP Council. We are provided for in the union bylaws. Um, there's a whole article spe specified just for the council and the article addresses the membership of the council, the structure of the council, and its function. So if you have any specific questions about any of those things, you can ask me or you can look at the bylaws. Um, the council really started in 2011. There's a lot of work. It was in the bylaws for a long time. Not a lot happened for a long time. And then when Jen Weaver started with the local, her and Michelle really put their heads together and figured out a way to get this going. Um, badgered some of us incessantly <laughs> to come to these meetings. And the first couple meetings, you know, there was two or three people. And then later that year, we got up to 10. And then there was, for probably like two years, there was a really solid group of 10 to 15 people that came to all the meetings did all the planning, developed um, a survey during the last round of contract negotiations, if you guys remember that survey, that was very long and very detailed, but provided really, really helpful information that we used um, in bargaining. And then after that, council kind of got big. Um, <laughs> and we've been adding people to the council ever since. We are now up to over 40 members. And the ultimate goal is to have a representative from every college and department on campus. Um, that if we can't get them from the department, at least we will have one for every college. So if you do not have a rep for your department or college, and you are interested in being a council representative, let me know. Um, if you would like to nominate one of your coworkers to be a rep, and obviously they approve because you've asked them that it's okay to do that, um, <laughs> let me know. Um, what we pretty much focus on is communication communicating from the executive board to our members, communicating from the membership back through, through the council to the executive board, share information about bargaining, share information about programming. The council was responsible for the academic forum series that's been going on for the last couple of years. We're still looking for someone to lead the academic forum next year. If anybody is interested in that, it is a wonderful service opportunity that allows you to work with both the union leadership and the university's leadership because the associate provost, provost, and president are regularly invited to speak at these events and they usually attend them. So 
something to keep in mind if you need service in a big committee. Um, so communication is, is pretty much what we're focusing on. Um, we are going to be developing a newsletter for the coming year that will aid in that as we kind of gear up towards all the information that we're going to start sharing for bargaining, which is going to be really, really important. Um, specific communication regarding bargaining is in our defined list of duties um, as council reps. Ricardo. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, one of the things that may not be apparent to folks, too, is that like the Academic Senate, this is one of the entities that has both academic staff and faculty yes. um, working together. And so usually more academic staff, but we're, we have, there are places we have a lot of, of faculty uh, participation in this as well. Um, and we did amend the bylaws to try to encourage um, both faculty and academic staff representation in colleges. So if there's someone that's a faculty member that is representing your college or your department, don't think that that precludes you as an academic staff member from putting your hat in the ring. Um, we obviously have different um, concerns than faculty do, so it's important to have both sides represented. Does anybody else have questions? I just, yes. I just wanted to mention that, um, that Mark Pilly has also done a lot of work on yes. uh, organizing. Thanks, and, Mark. Uh, so, uh, he loves him when we point him out. <laughs> <laughs> and has really helped the uh, the group to grow, as well as Kristen's leadership. And um, Deanna Kavanaugh has done a lot to keeping the records together. And so, yeah, yeah. Deanna is the um, treasurer of the council. I'm sorry, the secretary of the council. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Stand up, say <laughs> Robert, who is also a council rep. Yes. Yeah. Um, how do you like? Okay, what happens if people don't know what divisions are representative? Like, for instance, I know in nursing, there's no one there for nursing because they have to know the nursing people. But how do like people here might not know? Like when Jessica and I joined, we didn't know that. Right. Send me an email if you're not sure, and I can let you know who your rep is. And and then if you don't have one, that is a perfect opportunity for us to add you to the list. <laughs> yeah, I asked them, I was like, there's a web page for a council reps on our website yes. that shows who, who everybody is and where they're at. So, you can email that, that out. As well. Yes, yeah, we'll email that out. Um, if you, a lot of units that have um, a lot of people in them and they sometimes have elections for the rep instead of it just being the person that volunteers. Um, usually we only ask for an election if there's more than one person that wants to do it. Um, I can only recall that happening twice where there were multiple people that wanted to do it. Otherwise it's just people just volunteer um, to serve and then you know when they're done they're done. <laughs> when they get tired they're like okay somebody else can do this. Um, so if you have any questions about how to do that if you need to have an election um, we usually set them up at department meetings, um, depending on how you guys are structured and whether or not you have staff meetings, department meetings, college level meetings, um, we, can, we can do all that for you. So if you have any questions about how to be a rep, if you have a rep, what the duties are, um, the time commitment is totally on you. It's how much time you want to spend doing it. Um, some people just, you know, forward communications and make sure that the people in their units are getting all the information they need about what's going on. Other people are more active and have you know, conversations with their colleagues and you know, identify areas where there's concern and they let the grievance team know. Um, it's just about how comfortable you are in, in, in that role and how much you want to take on. Um, and I can help anybody work through any of that if they're interested. I've been a council rep at the Ruther for, I don't know, long time. Almost <laughs> as long as I've worked here. <laughs> I didn't have any questions. Okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Nada Simon. I have been on the Academic Senate for 12 years. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> what is the Senate? It is the faculty and academic staff governance body for the university. It is the official voice of the faculty and academic staff to the president and to the board of governors. Any individual can speak to a board member, to the president, or the provost. You have that right. Call this. 
First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> but this is the official Wayne State way of putting forth things that are important. And it, the key is academic. They're on academic issues. The president appoints senior university officials to serve on the seven committees, really six committees, because one of them is elections and only academic Senate members can be on the elections committee uh, as a liaison to the seven committees. The committees are policy committee, which is the executive committee of the academic Senate. There are seven members plus the president of the union, seven elected members plus the president of the union and the president of the academic Senate. That's an automatic. Um, budget, that's probably the most important committee because they're the ones who look at the money. It's a very tedious committee because, you know, one in one is 11 in my book and not two. <laughs> Curriculum instruction, that deals with what its name says. Facility support services and technology, they're the ones who you try to contact with that the bathrooms in State Hall are disgusting. <laughs> um, the ceiling is falling down in my classroom in Manugian. Faculty affairs deals with faculty issues. Research, research issues and the committee that I currently chair, Student Affairs. And we talk about the affairs of students. <laughs> we look at issues that are important to students. Um, one of the key things that the Student Affairs Committee did this year, we changed student code of conduct so that you cannot, if you are a student, turn in work for a subsequent class that you previously got credit for without the permission of the instructor. It's very key. It was implied, but now it's explicit. Uh, policy committee, uh, it's an elective committee. Four people are elected to one year term, and then one person is elected to a three year term, and then it becomes a two year term, and then it becomes a one year term. Policy committee meets basically every Monday from 1.30 to whenever, <laughs> usually hopefully 3.30. Uh, the Senate meets Wednesdays, usually the first Wednesday of the month unless it's September or January because we don't start um, until later. Uh, that meets from 1.30 to 3.30. Anyone who wants to can come to an academic Senate meeting. They are open to the public. If you're thinking of running for the Senate, I think you should at least show up once. If you go to the first one and the last one, the president gives a reception over at Jacob's house. Food's pretty good. Um, you know, plan according. <laughs> um, meetings and reports are on the Senate website. Every committee is, chair is responsible after each of the committee meetings to put minutes out. Um, this year, the Student Affairs Committee discussed the HIGH program. How many of you know what high, the HIGH program is at the university? When I do this to faculty, you know how many hands go up? Yeah. None. It is the program run by Mrs. Wilson, the president's wife, to make sure any student can continue his or her education if they are precariously housed or homeless. So it, it's been in existence for about two years now. And they give money, um, student supply. You need a 2.5 overall GPA, so you can't do it in your first semester here because you don't have a GPA. Um, be, and fill out an application and be enrolled in the semester for which you're asking for money. It's about $1,500. Or they can refer you to someplace, shelters or whatever. I mean, it's a good program. Uh, the Senate does important work. Uh, how many of you have gone to the GERC committee, the reform committee? 
to, to give feedback on the new, new general education. All right? That will come up through the Senate once they come up with a plan. Every college and division elects people. In the provost's office, we have only one person from each unit can be. So if three financial aid officers want to be on the Senate, only one can be. But we're all under the provost's office umbrella. It's exciting. Certain colleges, like pharmacy, will elect academic staff members. Other colleges, like nursing, they won't even let you run. <laughs> and having been in nursing, I know. Um, and it, it depends. It's an important committee. The policy committee has two academic staff members on it, myself and Vicki Dallas from Fine Performing and Communication Arts. Charlie's here. He's on policy as president of the AAUP AFT. And I think we give good input into the committee. Any, anyone have any questions? Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to make. Um, uh, the, the union um, appoints liaisons to the committee, all these committees. So we, there's, um, there's that connection between the, uh, the union and the academic senate. And I will be sending out very shortly um, some more information on that. Ways you might want to get involved if you're interested. And it's, the Senate is great service. I'm, I'm ready for my close up, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I in focus? <laughs> My name is Barbara Jones. I'm a financial aid officer and um, I'm also the contract implementation officer and I want to give you a little background on that be before I tell you what we do on the contract enforcement team and who's on the team. Michelle told you at the beginning that we got the professional schools involved because the administration thought it would be a really good idea, a way of um, not facilitating the union to operate. Well, that's how the, the, uh, the two academic staff members got on the contract enforcement, what grew into the contract enforcement team. We were in negotiations for the, uh, the 2002 contract, and the administration came back <laughs> sitting on one side of the table and thought this would be a really good way of throwing a, man a monkey wrench into the academic staff, who had always been the, the backbone of the, of the union. We, we, we're, we're always there in support. Um, so they came and said, we used to always have to depend on faculty, a faculty grievance officer and uh, a, a faculty uh, person to, to, to do the contract implementation. So that if we had a problem, we had to explain it to faculty who see things through the faculty eye uh, you know, nine months, uh, a whole different perspective than we have. So when they offered the one for the, um, for the academic st uh, staff to have their own people, we, we started to say, oh yeah. But we sat there calmly and said we'd like to discuss it. We went out in the hall and said, oh yeah, and came back and said, well, if you insist. <laughs> so that's how we, we now have, um, an, a grievance officer for um, the faculty and a grievance officer for the academic staff. We have a contract implementation officer, it's me, for the academic staff and one for the, the faculty. Um, Robert Arkin, um, professor in biology, is the, the contract implementation officer for faculty. And uh, Rita Casey, um, a professor in the, um, in the psychology department, is, is also the vice president of the union. So, as time moved on, we had our executive director who really got us organized and said, we're going to start meeting on a regular basis. So we get together on a regular basis every week and talk about any problem that is going on within the university so that everyone is on board. Charlie Parrish, of course, is our, is our president, is there. Michelle Fechter was there. Our great staff, Mark uh, Dilly is there, and uh, Tammy uh, Force, 
And then Ricardo Villarosa, who's the grievance officer for the academic staff, is there and I'm there. And the, I always say my job is to make certain that Ricardo doesn't have anything to do. Because if I can head off a grievance, and um, Bob Arkin does this on the faculty side, without having a grievance occur to talk to the administrative side of the house to get the parties together and work things out, we want to do that. But if we can't, then it moves on to agreements. But we never just charge in and start doing anything. The team comes together and talks about all aspects. What are our options? When things get really sticky, uh, we can also have our, um, our union attorney come in and talk with us and give us guidance. Have I covered everything, Michelle? Mm -hmm. Do I look great on camera? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ricardo. Oh. Just one thing to mention, you, you've heard about the formal titles, contract implementation and grievance coordinator, um, but really that team concept comes through, if you're a member who has a concern and you're worried about something, a lot of times people get scared off by the idea of grievance. Oh, I, I've got an issue, but I don't want to file a grievance. You can talk to any of us um, with your initial concerns, and we talk so much of what we do is not going to the formal grievance process. It's, it's finding solutions, working with the administration, working with different departments from the provost office. And the reason that we are so effective as a contract enforcement team is that there are times where we can add to the faculty conversation. And they, uh, so we, we really have developed a, a process where we're able to work on finding solutions that sometimes are creative because they take both sides of the team. And it gives us a fresh way to look at the, the, the activity. So, if you have a concern, you can go to any of us, directly from the union office, fire me, whoever you're most comfortable with initially, and we refer out when, as it gets appropriate. And we, sh again, we share things on our on those weekly meetings. So, that's I think the, the yeah. big thing is don't I, be afraid. I, I think of that, yeah, and then the key thing is, you know, sometimes it's 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 just a matter of talking with an administrator. Most administrators here are very cooperative. They want the same thing that we want. They want to come in and do their job and do it well and get along with everybody else. And then, you know, you have that 3%. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, 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 all, we all know about them. We used to always say, our contract now, I think, is 194 pages. And I know there are those of you who've heard me say that if we could just negotiate that, that there will be no bad management, we could get that thing down to 10 pages. <laughs> so, <laughs> any other questions? Thank you. I hope I'm part of the 97 percent. <laughs> um, I'm here um, representing Kate Burness, and she sends her regrets. And I extend my apologies because public speaking is probably one of the most difficult things for me to do. So uh, bear with me. I will try to do my best. So I'm here to talk about the Advisor Training Academy. The ATA is located in the UAC, which is in the SASS, which is downstairs. So, in the UGL. In the UGL, yeah, so um, alphabet soup. So um, the ATA was born because of the hiring of 45 advisors across this campus, and we wanted to develop a sense of community for our advisors and um, professional development. We know that there are some areas that don't have a lot of funds to send their advisors to conferences. So we wanted to do what we could to develop um, opportunities for professional de development right here on campus. So one of the things that we've done is we developed a six module training curriculum for all new advisors or uh, seasoned advisors as well who um, uh, just need some refresher. And we've had about 60 advisors go through the level one certification. And then um, the level two certification, we have about nine or 10 that have completed it. The advisors who go through level two certification, they need to, they go through the modules, but they also need to either do a scholarly paper or present at a conference or present at something that we do here at the ATA. And um, the advisors that go through level two, um, we give them a $250 stipend towards a registration for a conference. And so far, we've only had one advisor take us up on that. So um, if you've completed level two, please do so. I 
allotted some money in our budget so that we can support your professional development away from Wayne State. Um, we have a website, uh, we have Blackboard, um, newsletter and email. The um, council, there's a subcommittee in the council uh, for uh, professional development which helps Kate inform what some of the needs are for the advising community. I think we have two slides. Um, we do lunch and learns. We have ABC, which is our advisor book club. There's a directory. directory. What's really cool about the directory is that if you go on our website, it has all the advisors, but it lists their expertise. So if you're interested in appreciative advising, you could contact that advisor and maybe they could do a little one-on-one. -on -one. Or if we want to offer something here on campus, we can reach out to that person and ask them if they'd be willing to do a workshop for us. Um, so we have the recognition for the um, certification. Monica Brockmeyer, who I report to, comes in. We have a nice tea ceremony for the advisors who have gone through the program. I'm oh, sorry, there's the um, outcomes of the Advisor Training Academy. So um, we, we developed this from the Ohio State University model, and they came up and met with us. And in the advising world, we do a lot of R&D, which means rip off and duplicate, and <laughs> with permission. So um, we developed this. And um, we su submitted, Monica and I submitted to the HLC, the Quality Initiative, was the Advisor Training Academy. And the letter we got back from them was that we got the highest mark. So great work. And, and it's Kate Burnus. If anyone knows Kate Burnus, she is the person who runs this and takes care of it. She oversees all of it. So, um, you know, if you see her, congratulate her on the great work that she's been doing. Any questions at all on this? Yeah. Where do you look up that certification? Is it on the salary? How do you find the training? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go to the website. Everything's on the website, the calendar. Um, and, and this isn't just for advisors. So if, if you wanted to sit in as a non-advisor and learn things, you can. The next phase that we're going to do is we want to do training for uh, faculty advising. So faculty who advise and if they want to be a part of this too. We really, really want to develop this sense of community on this campus. In, in my office, we can just run down the hall and they can ask each other, but we know that there are advisors that are solo in a department and they may not have somewhere to go. So we want, we want the advisors to feel like they're all part of the community. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Laura Hetzler. Um, a lot of you I don't know actually. I work for Cheryl in the University Advising Center. Um, I specialize in pre-med and health science students and I'm the current president of the uh, Academic Advising Council. We are definitely one of the newest orgs on campus. We were founded in 2014 also as a result of the big hiring initiative with academic advisors. Um, I put our mission up here. We the goal is definitely to be proactive in ensuring student success across campus, um, making sure that all students get an equally excellent advising experience to help them be successful in their educational goals, um, and helping us as advisors work on recruitment, retention, and academic success, and making sure the university community is kind of integrating us across the, the boards with that. Um, I pulled some of our goals off of our, our uh, charter, our bylaws, because these are the ones that I think we really tend to focus on the most. Um, one is leadership, both with um, leaders as leaders of students, but also as leadership opportunities. Um, we have a council, our elections are coming up. Um, so we definitely try to provide a voice for different units. There is a provision that a certain number of members on the council have to be pro from professional schools. We tend to tilt a little heavily towards uh, class. So we're, we're trying to make sure that there's equal recognition across campus. Um, we also, again, the networking is really, really important to avoid the siloing, to avoid the people getting stuck in their offices. My favorite is... Ryan, who's actually now standing up, but Ryan talking about getting to campus and, and having to pick up the phone like, and call people all the time because he was stuck in his office. 
um, and we're really trying to make sure that that doesn't happen to people. We are trying to be advocates for one another and for our students to make sure that everyone has an excellent experience. I think that as advisors, we probably hate the expression uh, waned more than anyone else, and we do our best to keep our students from having that experience. Our, our last piece, and I, I guess this, this goes along with sort of the, the training that Cheryl talked about, um, is really trying to stay abreast of regional and national trends. So as a result of that, we've joined NACADA as an organization, and I would say a lot of us also participate in regional and national conferences, local conferences, and really encourage each other in bringing those ideas back um, and trying to get other advisors engaged in some of that stuff. Um, so there's some different ways we can get involved. One is, like I said, our elections are coming up. Nominations are open until May 5th. You, I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the nominations are open. They are, we have got four positions up. There's a president-elect, a treasurer, and two members at large. Um, and then the elections are going to run May 8th through 19th, yeah? Um, we have, so running and then voting. Mm -hmm. Rachel and I love it when enough people actually vote. Um, and we hate it when not enough people vote. <laughs> so voting is always good. Um, we're planning our first annual advisors picnic. And that's going to be May 24th. And that's to get that network in and build our sense of community. We have every year an annual meeting and summit. This year it looks like it's, uh, we're targeting early October this year. And our theme is going to be technology. So this is another opportunity to increase our professional development so advisors have that opportunity to present, put that on your professional record, and then to increase awareness of regional trends and on-campus trends. You know, we rolled out a huge technology piece. Um, so what are we all doing? What are our best practices? How are we using that new initiative to improve our advising and improve our student contact? So presenting, attending, and volunteering with that summit and meeting. Um, finally, joining a committee or being willing to, to be on a committee if asked. Um, we have a communications committee, a membership committee, a training committee, and a summit committee. Um, one of the best ways to find out more about our group is on the advisor is on the advisor training academy website. So this is what Cheryl was talking about when she said, "Go to the website. It's training." or it's advisortraining.wayne.edu. You can find it. If you go to wayne.edu and even just put in ATA, this is the first thing that comes up. And it links right to the Academic Advising Council. Um, and, and you get to our bylaws. You get to our organizational chart. Uh, you can find all the information about our group right there. So, any questions for me? No? Eligible voters. Uh, you have academic advisors. So ASOs who advise? Oh yeah, academic undergrad advisors. So ASOs who advise students? And ASOs who advise students. Yeah, because... Mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah. Ryan is the... What are you? You're the head of our training well, committee. <laughs> I talked to you on the phone at 9 o'clock this morning. Yeah. And, I'm, and I've lost it since then. So Ryan's the head of our training committee and he's going to talk for a hot minute too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I wanted to come in and talk a little bit about what the training committee is because I think it's confused a little bit of people uh, around campus, um, especially since there are already a lot of trainings for other things and there's mentorships. Uh, I wanted to make the point that, um, number one, this isn't a mentorship. Uh, number two, this isn't replacing the ATA. We actually encourage people very much to go to the ATA trainings later on. This isn't replacing any of the things that the ASPC or all the other groups do in training wise, what we want to try and do is supplement any of those trainings already, find things that are kind of missing from training uh, for advisors around campus, um, and try to also continue building that community of advisors uh, around Wayne State. We think that's very important going forward. The other thing that we just recently completed, um, and we, we have some of the new advisor, uh, new advisor liaisons in the room uh, already, was a new advisor liaison program. And we created this because we have so many new advisors coming in. And there wasn't always necessarily a plan in place for those new advisors to give them training on how to do their jobs right away. We have the ATA, which is great, but that can take months uh, before an advisor actually gets to that. And there's lunch and learns, and that can take a long time to get the information they need. 
So we created what was called a new advisor liaison program that whenever a new advisor is brought into the university, uh, on day one, they're going to meet another advisor who has been gone, who's gone through the training already. They're going to have a packet of information, uh, responsibilities, people to contact, different sheets that they can use. And some of this is actually taken right from the ATA uh, training as well. So they'll get it you know, initially there and then get a much deeper training um, through the ATA later on. And then also they have someone they can just talk to for that first six weeks. So like I said, this isn't a mentorship. This isn't supposed to go on for years. This is just to help that person once they get started here have all the information they need to be able to do their job right away. Like I said, some departments, some colleges do this quite well already, and what we have is just supplemental to them. And then they, the other aspect of it is welcoming them into the advisor community, because someone shows up at their door, presents them with this package. Um, even from this, we've decided to create a new logo for the AAC, um, and like I said, just trying to create more community. So it's going to have a packet, it's going to have a shirt for them eventually as well make them feel like they're a part of Wayne State, but then also give them the resources they need to be successful as an advisor here um, initially. And then obviously continue to have further development through the ATA or conferences and other things as well. So I just wanted to clear up all of that uh, about what it was. If you do have new advisors coming in, uh, you know, you can contact uh, me for that. I probably should have put my contact information up there. Uh, but yeah, you can send that out. Um, but my name is Ryan Franey. I'm, I'm the academic advisor with the political science department here. Um, so you can look for me uh, in that way if you have any questions about it. Any questions right now? Okay, well, thank you. <laughs> I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you again to all of our presenters. If we could just say thank you to everybody. All of the talent, the skills, the resources in this room dedicated to us in our roles. And so I'm very grateful for those that are a little bit newer, those that are a little bit more, I say, seasoned, um, that are in the room and all that, that you've had to share with us as advisors. Because this is our last event, I do want to just give a sh one more shout out to those that have served on the ASSC this year. So if Shauna and Cynthia and Don can come on up.